In tonight's Dayline Defense, the ISIS internet problem. U.S. officials believe the terrorist organization is using the deep web to recruit and potentially plan attacks. So how big is the threat? Well, for insight in this, we turn to our guest insider on Capital Insider, Colonel Cedric Layton, a retired Air Force intelligence officer and president of Cedric Layton Associates. Colonel, I want to start with the news of the day before we get to the deep web, and that is that drone that was attempted. Uh, someone tried over the White House fence. The White House acted quickly, but there's ongoing concern. Some people say more needs to be done. Others say nothing can be done to stop that small of a, a, of a device. Some say they can disable the remote control devices entirely. What's the answer here? Well, Rebecca, the answer is that uh, you know right now our radar coverage is not adequate to get things like drones to capture that kind of an activity as it goes over the White House fence or uh, attacks Capitol Hill or anything like that. So there's clearly a gap in radar coverage. One thing that could be done is to interrupt the signal between the controller and the drone. And if that signal is known and if that frequency is monitored, then or those frequencies are monitored, then what you can do is you can actually go in and uh, cut that ability to control the device and that then would result in it not being able to fly over areas that are restricted. So how difficult is that to do and there would there be any fallout effect? I mean we all know when you're driving past the Pentagon your cell phone may cut out and we all suspect it has something to do with the Pentagon being able to jam those kinds of devices. So is this something the White House could do tomorrow and would there be any implications for the rest of us as we work in that downtown area? The one thing that they have to do is they would have to assess whether or not the frequency bands that are used to control drones are actually frequency bands that are used for other forms of communication, so they'd have to do an impact study. Once that's done, then they can implement it. So they could theoretically do it tomorrow, but this is Washington, so I wouldn't expect it to happen tomorrow, but maybe a couple months from now or a year from now. The drone flyers are moving faster than the pace of bureaucracy, a good point to make. Well, let's get to this whole issue of the deep web. Our colleague Barbara Starr wrote about it at CNN, and she says it's something that's concerning the Pentagon when it comes to ISIS. So they've developed technology to try and get at it. What is the deep web that ISIS is using, and what is the Pentagon trying to do to thwart their use of it? Well, they're actually of web that are of interest to those of us who are tracking ISIS and especially to the intelligence community. There's the deep web and then there's the dark web. Basically about only 16% of the web is accessible via normal search engines like Google or Bing or something like that. So what you're talking about with the deep web is stuff that is connected to the internet but it may be encrypted. There may be other ways to limit the access to it uh, so it is not immediately accessible to the general public. One way to get into it is through a search engine like device known as Tor and that is how many people get into that and they are they're able to track it a lot of illicit activity happens on these websites uh, for example Russian criminal gangs use them to post things like credit card numbers from cyber hacks that they have done things like that happen on the deep web on the dark web the dark web is one that is actually cut off from the internet and theoretically it has no link whatsoever to the existing internet as we know it. Uh, but uh, there are ways to get into that and there are ways to look at that and that is exactly what intelligence agencies uh, are doing and what they're looking at in order to find ISIS. It is absolutely possible that recruiting is taking, pl taking place on the deep web and on the dark web and that is the one key thing uh, that will allow us to work with law enforcement as well as the intelligence community to put an end to those kinds of practices or at least make them more difficult. Now, intelligence officials have said, listen, we shouldn't focus exclusively on ISIS. They're just one of many groups posing grave threat to the U.S. And, and our allies right now. But ISIS has been particularly adept at using social media and other forms of advanced uh, ways of reaching out that we have been surprised by. Are you optimistic that the Pentagon and its own technology is closing in on both the deep web and the dark web? Or are you concerned that they will always be one step ahead of us because of the fast advancement of technology? Well, I think the key thing is that technology advances very quickly, Rebecca. One of the key areas, though, is that uh, generally speaking, most of the technology that is used on the Internet was developed in the United States. So that allows us to go in and allows us to do things that otherwise uh, we would find difficult to do. But uh, the ISIS threat on the Internet is a very serious threat. Uh, they are more adept at the social media aspects as opposed to the cyber warfare aspects, but they're learning quickly, and that's the one thing that we need to thwart. 
Now we know Homeland Security has warned, and, it, and it's patently obvious to anyone, ISIS could strike at any time. We saw the attack in Texas that was linked to ISIS that merely was motivated by use of Twitter. But how much do you rate ISIS as the predominant threat right now, or do you see other emerging groups or states as bigger threats right now to U.S. security? One of the key factors with ISIS, Rebecca, is that it has not really manifested itself as being very active on the U in the U.S. homeland. However, uh, that is changing, and as we continue with our operations against ISIS, uh, that is clearly going to change. And I think what we'll see is we're going to see an effort to uh, by on the part of ISIS to go after us and to make attacks on the homeland. So I think it is a future threat. I believe it is a future threat in the mid to long term, but it is something that we definitely need to be concerned with because it is a, really an existential effort on their part to fight us in, that, in this regard. Let's turn to what would be a parlor game this week in Washington if it weren't so serious, and that's authorization of NSA uh, monitoring techniques. The Senate wants to pass what Senator McConnell calls a clean bill that would simply reauthorize NSA's ability to gather um, data and intelligence and phone calls. The House has passed a reform piece of legislation that would leave that information with company, private sector companies that then the government would have to request. They're at a bit of a stalemate right now, but time is ticking, and the authorization runs out at the end of the month. If you have a man, what do you think is going to happen by the end of this month? Is, are they going to get the so-called clean legislation without any changes that Senator McConnell wants in the Senate? Or are they going to get the House reform? Or are we going to get nothing and the whole uh, ability to gather that intelligence will simply expire? Well, I think that based on the types of threat that are out there and the fact that the cyber domain has in essence become a key area of intelligence collection, uh, there's going to have to be something. It would be irresponsible on the part of Congress not to pass some form of legislation. Uh, the so-called clean bill that the Senate would have is basically continuing the program as it exists right now, so that means that metadata would be collected by NSA and it would in essence be allowed to be part of the intelligence picture that we gather. Any type of terrorist attack, whether it's a foreign attack or a domestic attack, uh, is going to affect us in this way, and it will be key if we have the types of information that are derived from this kind of intelligence. So having said that, I think that uh, it is highly likely that some form of the so-called clean bill will pass. I think there will be aspects of what the House has passed, which means an end to the metadata collection program as we know so it. So I just have to ask you, we're running out of time. Time, but the House reform would uh, still allow private sector companies to hold that information. You're retired. You get to answer this honestly. Where is it safer? Is it safer being held by the private sector or is it safer being monitored by the government? What would you tell your clients? From a technical aspect, it is safer with the government at present, and the reason for that is the government has certain safeguards that they're used to uh, keeping. Uh, there also are provisions in place in terms of policy that keep it very clear that it is essential that employees not divulge the kind of information that they have access to. However, uh, I believe that private sector companies can catch up with the government in this area, and if they're given enough training and enough lead time, uh, equal of the government when it comes to protecting this kind of very critical, personally identifiable information. Colonel, no easy answers. That's why I left government and went into journalism. I knew it was easier to ask the questions than to come up with the solutions. So thank you for giving us your expertise tonight. My pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you.